Oh, so good morning fellow YouTubers. It's early in the day here. So before I get too far into it, I'm just gonna have myself a coffee. Get that on the go. But uh, I'll finish off my coffee and then I'll kick back to heading down the trail and get into camp. So I just wanted to say that, uh, sorry for the delay on putting out this video. You know, big Rona rolling through town has just kind of put a kink in things. I've been busy. I went through a separation with my partner and all of a sudden lockdowns kicked in and stuff. So I've been doing a fair bit of prepping and that kind of thing for long term at home. I just haven't had the time to make a video. But they've lifted the lockdowns temporarily, which is always good. And uh, giving me a window to get back out into the woods. They had shut down the woods and everything in the location I'm in. So my availability to the area was limited. And even when I came back, I found a bunch of the access roads and stuff in the meantime have been destroyed. Oh. Get a bear in my location. He's really close to me. He's sitting right there. That's right where I was hoping to set up camp. Hopefully the camera's picking that up. We got within about 40 feet of each other. He seems to be wandering off the other way now. So I'm just gonna pause and give him a bit of time to wander out. But, hey, good morning. <laughs> okay, so I've given him about 10 minutes or so to kind of move on. Either way, I want to get this backpack off me now. I want to be freed up a little bit. I do have my bear mace with me on my hip. I had that out for a few minutes, but like I said, he headed off that direction. So I'll quickly just get my bag up and uh, kind of free myself up a bit. So like I said, I've got a six to eight foot length of cordage. Got a loop on the one end. Just gonna wrap that around the tree. I'm gonna feed my cordage back through itself. So I'm cinched onto the tree solid. Take a stick. I'm gonna form a marlin spike hitch. Set my stick into that. Just so I'm braced onto the tree, good and solid. I figure if I talk, I make a bunch of noise. And the bear will be a little more resistant to coming my way again. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, like I say, one way or the other, I want this off. It just frees me up. Now I'm just going to feed that toggle through the handle on my backpack. Just get that up on that tree. Keeps me up off the ground. Keeps things drier. So I am going to kind of, now that I'm freed up a bit, is I am going to kind of just do a little perimeter sweep and see if he's still right near the area that I'm in or if he's moved on further. But uh, yeah, one way or the other, I don't want him interfering with my video as I go, right? So he only looked like he was about 150, 200 pounds. He's not a huge bear, so I'm not overly concerned. But I mean, it's still a bear one way or the other, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'll cut back in a few minutes once I've kind of cruised the area. I'll bring the GoPro with me, and if I spot him again, I'll catch it, and if I don't, I won't bother throwing it in. I'll just get back to setting up camp, but I really want to make sure he's not around. Okay, so I did a perimeter sweep, and uh, he's still out in that location over in this direction. There's water that runs along a couple, maybe about five, six hundred feet. It runs along the forest edge over here and then kind of wraps around that corner a bit 
So he's probably about 800, 1,000 feet out that way. I can hear him as he's cracking through bushes and stuff. But as I draw closer to him, he keeps retreating and moving away from me. So I'm pretty sure that he doesn't want to kind of come into the area that I'm in. So needless to say, I'm going to whip together my tripod and get that up and running so I can kind of film from different angles a little better. But I've got my loop of cordage here, just tied together with a fisherman's knot. I'm going to, I grabbed, uh, I am going to be keeping my eyes peeled though. <laughs> I, uh, I grabbed three sticks that were just laying in the area. I'm going to put that cordage over top of those. They're laying side by each with each other. I'm just going to wrap the middle stick now. Just try to get it where it's up close to the top. There's only a couple inches down. I'm just going to wrap that middle stick a couple times. Just to give me a quick tripod. This one doesn't have to be super strong. Just enough to get the camera up off the ground. Give me something to latch onto. But, uh, but yeah. Okay, so for this camp project, I'm going to first off need two sticks that are about six and a half, seven foot in height. You know, roughly, give or take. So I've got one of them that was available. I've camped in this location before, so this is one of the sticks I used in a previous project. So I've got this one available, but I need to grab myself one more larger stick that's like this. So I'll go and grab that now, and uh, we'll start to get the shelter set up. So I got two sticks from the location that I'm in. This is an active logging area, so it wasn't hard to find these. Somebody had downed a tree, and these were sitting over in the debris area that they had taken the tree. But uh, yeah, once again, just like the tripods, I'm going to take a loop of cordage, I'm going to double it up on itself, hook that onto both these pieces of wood. I want them relatively close to the top. And now I'm just going to take one of them and just start spinning it. I'm just going to keep doing that over and over again until they tighten up to each other and that cordage just binds to itself. Like I say, nothing complex here. It's just really a rapid way to kind of lash sticks together without having to get in a bunch of knots and all that kind of stuff. So I've got a bipod now that I'll be able to use. I'll just set this aside, but this will be used for the shelter. So I'm just going to get my tarp out now. In this video, I might use a couple tarps, but for the primary shelter, I plan on using my 10 foot by 10 foot. I think that's three meter by three meter. Uh, I've got an AquaQuest tarp that's about a pound and a half or so. So I'll haul it out of this bag and start to set up. I'll switch angles here and show you where I'm going to be setting up because I want a nice flat bed, even though this terrain is relatively even. You want to find kind of the flattest spot you can so you can have a comfortable night's sleep, right? So I'll just, uh, yeah, like I say, get the tarp out and kind of point out where I'm going to be heading to. So there's a really level patch of ground here that sits probably about 10 foot in length, about four foot wide. This is where I want to put my bedding down. It'll give me the most comfortable night's sleep. So like I say, I just got to get the tarp out. So I'll keep an eye out for that bear. It's been about 20 minutes, half an hour now since the bear sighting. <laughs> so I know he's still going to be close to the area, but... One way or the other, you just got to kind of move on with life, right? So I'm just going to kind of set this out. I'll lay it out nice and flat and then I'll show you guys kind of how I plan on configuring this as I set it up. So let me just straighten that out. I'll cut scenes, come back and kind of walk through the shelter build. Okay, so I've laid out my tarp now. As you can see, it's a square tarp. I've laid it out on the angle and the thinking really is this back tie out point. I know I've got tie out cordage on the corners. I normally just leave those on my tarps quite often, but I'm going to take the back corner and I'm going to peg that to the earth. Really simple, nothing complex in that regard. 
I've got angles here. This is a really simple shelter and really rapid to set up. With this corner, it's opposite the one that I just pegged to the earth there. I'm just going to take a stick and through that tie out loop that I have on the tarp, I'm just going to set that stick in there. I'll just leave that there for right now. I'll cut scenes and show the next step. So now that bipod that I made a few minutes ago in the video, I'm going to take that bipod and open it up now. And then I'm going to take that toggle stick I just set into the tarp. I'm going to lift that up. And I'm going to hook that right into the V at the top of the bipod. And for the short term, I'm just going to kind of let the tension of the bipod set against itself to hold that in place. You say still keeping an eye out for bears. <laughs> this will end up having a guy lines tied off to it that kind of come out and set. Potentially I'll come off to a tree here and then put a tarp over top of this area. But I'll show you as we go. But this is kind of a way to get this end of the tarp up and off the ground. If you don't have a lot of tree uh, trees to tie off to, this kind of gives you an easy way to lift that up and have it elevated. So I'll try to get this point to be as high as I can once I tie this off and stuff. Right now it's a little lower than it would actually be just because I'm using tension to kind of su su support it and that kind of thing. But uh, when I do the tie-offs and that kind of stuff, I'll have this kind of open in as high as I can so it's easy to get in and out of the shelter. So I'm just going to grab one of my uh, hanks of rope that I use for a ridge line. I tend to be fairly rope heavy. I carry a lot of rope. Um, I wouldn't mind using one of my rapid ridge lines if I can dig it out of here. Yeah, there we go. So in a previous video, I show in detail of exactly how these rapid ridge lines are made. So. I'm going to use this as part of my ridgeline set to help keep the shelter in place. So now this tree is opposite of where the bipod is on the shelter. It's straight across from it pretty well and I'm about maybe 20-30 foot away. So the thinking really with these um, rapid ridgelines is I've got a prusik loop that sits on the line to make it adjustable. And I've got a toggle on a prusik loop that sits on the line. And I'll just pull that out a bit more. So the thinking really is, I take the prusik with the loop on it, I simply wrap it around the tree. The other prusik that's on that line that has the toggle on it, I can slide up and down that line when there's no tension on it. I take the prusik, the first prusik I wrapped around the tree, I simply just hook it onto that toggle. And then I can adjust that at will to set it wherever I want. So I want to have my ridge line to be above my head height by about half foot or so. And that way, you know, things are up above where you're not having to duck and kneel to get into your shelter, if you will, later. So, and I can set that right against the tree. I normally like to leave a little bit of flex when it comes to this prusik here. And that way it's just kind of easier to adjust things later. So I'll just let that hang for now. I'm going to take the rest of the hank of rope, run it out and connect it onto the bipod on the other side. I'll switch camera angles and show you that. So I'm simply going to run out my hank of rope when I come up to the bipod end. Now, like I say, because this is these rapid ridge lines are all based on prusiks, it's very adjustable now where even though I've got surplus on the cord where I could go further out, I can slide these prusiks along and just adjust them to whatever point I need them to be at. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the same concept I did on the tree. I've got the prusik. I'm simply going to loop around here. I'm going to hook it onto the toggle so that everything kind of locks in place there. And now that part is on. And now I can simply slide those prusiks along the line to apply the tension that I need. And as the tension builds, I can start to lift now 
the height in which I want this to sit at because I know that uh, I don't have to rely on the tension of the bipod holding this tarp and you know keeping everything in position the tension then shifts over to the ridge line where I can use that to make my adjustments and I can set this as tight as I want it to be and like I say the bipods now instead of using them to hold up the walls of the shelter the bipods are now really just to help elevate the shelter up and the ridge line is doing the heavy lifting for the tension if you will so I'll just kind of set the rest of the ridge line that comes off because these rapid ridge lines are so adjustable I'll just kind of set them back and out of the way I'll clean that up in a minute but now as you can see I've got my ridge line up and like I say I'll just adjust it with a bit more tension and now it's taut and this ridge line is well above my height so if I put a secondary tarp over top of it I'm not having to duck and kneel to get in and out of it I, I definitely want to have that be pretty well as high as possible but I still want this entrance of the V of the bipod to be wide enough where I can get in and out of it with ease so like I say I made uh, a detailed video of exactly how these rapid ridge lines are made but as you can see I'm lashed onto the tree here when I come across I've already got preset prussics on the line for tying tarps off to I've got three of them on this line here and here and that way I can easily hook on um, tarps and adjust these prussic loops to wherever I need them to be to apply the tension and then when I come down further this is the exact same concept I did over at the tree where there's a toggle here and it hooks onto the prussic loop and that's what applies the tension and kind of locks everything and then I can uh, slide these prussics along the line to really make the ridge line tense and adjustable on the end with the tree on it if I wanted to adjust the height there I just loosen off the prussic it takes tension out of this line and then I can adjust the height up and down on the tree where I want it and then just slide this prussic back out again and it'll just make everything tense again so and as you can see with the bipod the bipod is now standing more of a straight up and down position if you will now the thinking is the other two remaining corners of this tarp shelter I'm just gonna take these I'm gonna pull them out and peg them down as such so I'll cut angles here peg those to the earth and then uh, kind of show you the first main step of the shelters progress so I'll grab two more of my tent pegs you could easily make tent pegs out of the resources available on the terrain but I tend to carry them just to cut time on the videos I know my videos get a little long sometimes given the nature of what I'm doing so anyway I can kind of shave a few minutes here and there I do and that way I can fit in more juicy content <laughs> but really simply I'm just going to take those tie out points the loops in the tie out stick a tent peg through it set it into the earth I'll do the same on the other side Slide my tent peg into the tie-out loop, pull it out, apply tension, set it in place. So this gives you a, a quick plow point shelter, you know, where you can set it up and if you don't have a lot of large trees to tie off to and that kind of thing, you can use a bipod to do that. Um, normally when I set up shelters, I tend to like to have, I could even adjust this one a little, I think. I don't like the sagginess of it. I like all my shelters to be really rigid. There we go. Just set that in. So normally yeah, I like to have a tarp to set up my shelter, but I also like to have a tarp to set up. I'm in a rainforest environment. And quite often, you know, the rains come and go here a fair bit. 
So what I'll normally end up doing is putting a secondary tarp up to give me an area to work in. You know, it's fine and dandy if you want to go minimalist and only take a single tarp and that kind of thing. I like to have two or three, I think in my bag, I normally carry three or four lightweight small tarps where if I want to set them up for multiple things to give me a dry environment to work in, it gives me that capacity. But I'll do a pan around of this uh, paw point shelter and kind of show you before I move on to the next step and put up a, a tarp off the ridgeline. So anybody that's spent any time in the woods knows plow point shelters are pretty standard. You know, typically you would end up setting these up facing a large tree and just use the tree. Oh, sorry about the tree. You use the tree as a way to brace. But I wanted to show this example where potentially if you didn't have large trees to set up with, or the large trees you were very minimal, you only had one or two to work with, of how you could kind of do more advanced setups even though the resources are skimpy. So, but as you can see with the plow point shelter, it now lines up. I pointed out earlier in the video where there's kind of this flat area here where I'll be able to bed down in. It's probably about the flattest in the entire zone. So I'll clear out all the small debris that's in there and kind of get that ready to set my bedding in. But this gives an ample shelter you know, if this was set up a more even terrain, you could easily sleep two, three people in there if you had to. And like I say, I'm on uneven terrain, always. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in my situation, it's only good for the one. But I'll uh, throw up my tarp shelter. Well, I'll probably clear out in underneath there first and just throw in my bedding. I've got my uh, Thermarest Ridge Rest mat here. I'll throw that down, probably throw the sleeping bag in on it, just so that starts to air up and all that kind of stuff and then i'll look at hooking on an additional tarp onto this ridge line as my next steps okay so i cleared out all the small debris that was in there that you know would have been the back breakers if you will i'll just get my uh roll mat out ground mat whatever you want to call that now this is uh, uh one of the large thermo rest ridge rest as you can see, over the years, I've worn off most of the mylar on there, but I think it'll be time to get a new one. But I really find for, you know, air mattresses and that kind of stuff, yeah, they're comfortable. But if you're really out in these types of terrains where there's a lot of sharp sticks and that kind of stuff, unless you've got something to protect your air mattress or that air mattress is made out of some amazing material, they're going to pop. Of I generally find these um, foam mattresses, the durability of them is way greater, I find, that uh, even though it doesn't give me the same level of comfort, uh, having the Mylar, the Ridge Rest, Thermo Rest, having the Mylar on there helps reflect a lot of the body heat back at you. You know, it doesn't, uh, they're not ranked at the same R value, but for durability and longevity, I find these are way better than air mattresses, I really do. But uh, I'll go switch angles and I'll throw this in and show you um, like I said, this is the large version of this, which I think is 6.3 or something. Um, so I'll toss it in under the shelter and you can see how much room is available in there. So nothing fancy. Just roll it out. Now you can see I've got ample coverage. And this thing's, I can slide that back a few feet before... I'm even worried about uh, touching the tarp on that end. But as you can see, you know, I mean, here I've got a couple feet ahead of me that's covered. I'm not worried about the rain. It would have to be blown in on a hard angle in order for it to reach me. Then if I put up a tarp on that ridge line that's running there, any winds that would be blowing in on this angle are the, the rain effects would be mitigated by the tarp. But, you know, and as you can see, I got tons of room in here, you know? It's it's amply big enough for me to sit in here and do things and have lots of room to move around and that kind of stuff without feeling constrained. But I still like having a large area to work in. If I'm doing projects that uh, require a bit of space for me to kind of muddle about doing what I'm doing, I still always like to have an additional tarp sitting up as a ridge line to give me a work area separate from my shelter. So I'll be throwing that up next. So normally in this bag, I carry, like I say, 
pretty well a complete shelter system. I've got the tarp that you've seen me set up as this shelter. I've got my poncho tarp, which if you've watched other videos of mine, I use lots as well. But I also carry my hammock. I've got a really lightweight hammock in here. Um, what is it? The Rue Single Hammock by Kamek. And uh, it's got all its lines and stuff. Having this all in a kit in a bag gives me flexibility. If I want to go down to the ground, I can. If I want to be up in the air, I can. And this whole setup weighs about, uh, I think it's about three pounds, three and a half, four pounds, somewhere in around there. It's very lightweight, but uh, it, it just allows me, depending on the terrain I'm in, you know, quite often I'll make videos where I'm on the ground and doing shelters set up like this. And really, it's far more limiting for me to do those videos. It's more interesting for the viewer to watch and see, you know, oh, you know, 50 different ways from sideways of how to set up a shelter. But quite often when you're in this uneven terrain like I'm in, it's not really practical to be down on the ground. Quite often for ease, I just want to be up in a hammock and up off the ground. It allows me to set up in places where you would never even imagine setting up on a ground shelter setup. And the forest I'm in, given that it's a rainforest, is so thick that just by switching up to a hammock, it opens up my options. But, you know, there's some people that swear by, you know, being on the ground and some people swear by being up in a hammock. I go with the premise of be flexible, have lightweight gear that works in all the environments because you never know what the kind of terrain is that you're going to be encountering and you want to make sure you have the equipment to be able to do any terrain with ease. So like I say, I'll unfurl this and kind of look at starting to get this up and attached onto that ridge line now. So I'll cut angles and then I'll cut back to actually, you know, setting this all up. Okay, so with my tarp, I've got tie out lines that are connected to the corners of this poncho tarp that I normally just leave on the line. I could turn around and hook onto this prusik and kind of set, but given the nature of how these rapid ridge lines are and the fact that there's a bit of real estate taken up where I'm binding off to the tree, I'm just going to take the little loop that sits in my poncho tarp and I'm going to hook that right on the stick of the bipod and that way I'm nice and close to this point where I'm going to start my tarp. And then I'm going to take the other end, I'm going to hook it on to the prusik loop that I showed earlier in the video sitting on this ridge line. I'm just going to put a, a, a toggle on onto this ridge line with a, with a marlin spike hitch, hook it onto that prusik, pull it out and apply tension. So I'll show that in detail. Okay, so like I say, I've got this kind of guy outline sitting on there. Oh. And it already had a prusik on it. Of course, the knot of the prusik is going to get in the way. It always happens when I'm recording, right? Normally, these lines just pull right out, but every time I'm filming, there's always some complication. <laughs> so, given that I've got this prusik on here, there's two ways I could have gone. I'll show you both. So, I've got just the line that's coming off as a guy line. If I put a loop in that and then roll that loop on itself, I could stick a toggle in. And just attach a toggle, oh, just attach a toggle straight on to that line. And that gives me a way to kind of cinch onto that guy line easy enough. I can go that way, but because I have this prusik on the line, I'll sw switch gears and see and when you take the stick out and you kind of pull it out, it just straightens out and that Marlin spike hitch just disappears. But given that I've got a prusik loop on the line now. It's easy enough to take this prusik and I roll it on itself, grab the into or the inside two pieces, kind of pinch them with the finger like that and open it up and this creates a lark's head knot where I can attach that toggle on just the same. So depending on um, if you've got marlin spike hitches on your line or not, you know, you could use either one of those knots. If the Marlin Spike Hitch is uh, the one you need, easy enough. If you need to use just a little Lark's Head knot on that Prusik loop to hook a toggle onto it, easy enough, right? So now I'll take this toggle and I'll attach it onto the Prusik loop that's up on the ridge line. So now I'm going to take that toggle we just attached onto the Prusik with the Lark's Head knot there. I'm just going to simply hook that onto the Prusik line that's sitting on the ridge line. I'm just going to feed that through and make sure it's rope on rope. 
I don't want the rope to be sitting on that stick and applying tension to the stick as much as possible. And then I'm just going to slide this prusik along and apply tension to that tarp. And you can make that really taut. And these two points are now strapped up to your ridge line. It's really that simple. So now I've got two more tent pegs. Now I'm gonna, I've got, like I said, I've got these guy lines tied on, or tied onto the tarp already to begin with. So I'm just gonna pull those out. And typically on my guy lines, I end up having prusik loops already strapped right onto them. So if I tend to, I tend to do that uh, pretty well all my guy lines, generally speaking. Uh, I'll leave a couple to do examples of alternative methods, but um, these prusiks make it really easy now to, I, I want to apply tension to the opposite point on the tarp. I want this line to be taut and I want it to be taut opposite angle. And that way, when I go to set this all up, there's really a nice solid uh, tension to the entire tarp. Now, because I've got this prusik loop sitting on the line, it's adjustable now to where I want to set my tent peg into the ground. So as long as I know that my guy line has enough tension or enough length to it, I should say, to, uh, to um, make sure that I can reach my tent peg with the adjustable prusik, I just pick a spot that looks good in the earth to set my tent peg into. This appears to be a half decent location. I now just adjust my prusik loop, set it onto that tent peg. I'll just make sure my tent peg's nice and in the ground. about as far as it'll go. And now I just want to slide that prusik and apply tension on the prusik. And it'll tension off the line easily enough. I'm going to do the same on the other corner now. So now I'll just show that again on this last corner where I've got my guy line. I know my guy line has a length where I can reach about here. I'll get another couple inches off the prusik if I really need to. But I don't need to go quite that far. I don't need to max it out. And then I turn around and say, all right, this looks like roughly a good location to set in my tent peg, drive it into the earth. I slide my prusik loop along, just hook it onto that tent peg and then apply tension onto that tarp now. And by doing so, it allows it to easily adjust. If I see that my tent peg isn't sitting into good earth, if you will, I'm not able to get down deep with it. I can easily move that tent peg around as long as I'm within the length of my guy line. I can move that tent peg into a different location and find a better spot to ground down without having to be, you know, stuck in a single spot. And by using the prusik, it allows it that the distance this tent peg is from the tarp doesn't have to be set in stone either. It's all adjustable, it's flexible. So it makes it easy when you're working with the train to really set up your ideal configuration depending on the train you're dealing with. So as you can see now, I've got a good top tarp. It's set out nice and rigid. You know, this is a very small tarp. I think it's six foot by eight foot or something. It's, you know, it's, it's really designed to be a poncho um, and just improv as a tarp if need be. But I like having this kind of smaller footprint of a tarp with this flexibility where if it really started pissing down rain out, I could switch up and, and wear a poncho as I'm moving through the terrain. But now, as you can see, it gives me a substantial amount of area that I can work in. Uh, you know, I'll pull out my stool here in a second and kind of gives me an area that I can really work in that I'm not just restricted to being in my shelter. I do have an 8x10 tarp. I haven't brought it with me in this video, but potentially I could have thrown that over and formed like more of an A-frame style shelter and given myself a really large area to work within. And with this ridge line as high as it is, I could have even put it a little higher, but with this ridge line as high as it is, it gives me room where I can pretty well stand up and, and get in and out of these areas with ease without having to, you know, hunch down all the time and feel like I'm, you know, hunchback in Notre Dame kind of thing going on, right? You, you definitely want to create as comfortable of an environment as you can when you go to set up your shelters because if you're staying in these things and you're going to be in them for you know three days a week whatever you end up doing depending on the resources you're you're harvesting off the land or that you brought with you you definitely want to have it where this is home this is your comfort zone you know you might roam off to the field and explore different terrain and that kind of stuff but you really want to kind of get a home shelter or a home base set up that gives you almost all the creature comforts you would have in your own home 
you know, and that way you can be in these places for extended periods of time without feeling like you're under some undue hardship. You know, uh, I really should have, given how bad the mosquitoes are today, I really should have brought along my uh, mosquito netting and set that up as well, but, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? But uh, it's worth packing the extra little bit of weight of having two or three tarps to really gain those creature comforts that you're, you're going to want if you're out there for any length of time. So at this point in time in the video, I'm going to set up my trusty stool. This is one of the, definitely one of the creature comforts that I always like to have with me. Uh, you know, something to quick and easily get you up off the ground and give you a lot of comfort. You know, like I say, it's nice to just sit and relax every now and again and feel like, you know, you're, you're not just existing out here, but you're, you're comfortably surviving, right? So I'm going to have some water. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to change over the batteries in the camera and that kind of stuff. They're getting close to the end of their life, so i got to toggle out my battery supply and that kind of thing. So it's time for me to take a break and time for you guys to do some work. If you enjoy this type of content, you know, like, share, and subscribe and that kind of thing. Like I say, I'll do what I have to do around here to kind of get things going. And then I'll move on to uh, the fire pit configuration and how I'm going to set up my fire area of... Uh, I've got something a little different this time I want to show you guys, so stay tuned. There's still more content coming in the video. So I'm done dawdling about. And then my next step really is going to be setting out my fire area. So I want to be conscious of, I want to be within reason close to my shelter and my tarp. But I still want to be, in my perspective, I still want to be at least about six feet away. Now, if you want some distance, because the hot sparks that come off of the wood, if the fire kind of gets going, you don't want to have them make pinhole burns in any of your tarps. If you watch previous videos of mine, you'll see that a lot of these tarps I've owned and shown in many, many videos in the past, and they've lasted me years, really. Of, and a lot of the reason why is I'm very conscious of the fact that I don't want to damage these tarps. I don't want to have pinhole burns. I've done it to one or two in the past when, you know, when I first got into these things. And, you know, you make the mistakes and you learn from them. But uh, I, I definitely want it to be, like I said, a good at least, my arm stretches about six foot. So, you know, within reason, I see there's a little low-lying area here. So I'm going to probably set in around this area. Yeah, there's some dead roots and that kind of stuff that have to come out of there. But uh, I'm going to uh, set this area and just use the heel of my boot to kind of do the heavy lifting, if you will, for me. And uh, I'm going to scrape out a circled area that's about two foot. And I want to take all this stuff and kind of set it aside in its own special pile, if you will. Because later on, uh, you know, when I'm done doing this video and I'm done with the fires and all that, I'm going to end up making sure my fire is all out. I'll take the burnt wood, that if there's any left over, and disperse them throughout the woods to be nutrients to the trees in the area and not leave any type of uh, eyesore, if you will. And then I'll take all this foliage that I've scraped off and I'll put it back on there. And a lot of that foliage, like the mosses and those types of things, will just reset themselves back into the ground and they'll feed off of the ashes and stuff of the fire and it actually gives nutrients to the land if you will so I don't feel bad in that regard but the key thing is you don't want to have roots that are underground you don't want to have them creating you know embers that are running through those root lines and like I say in the area I'm in it's uh, more of a rainforest style environment so I don't have heavy concerns about those things but if you're in drier climates where these roots might be really dry underneath the earth, you definitely want to make sure that you're not creating underground fires that are kind of running through root systems. That can be dangerous to the entire forest and you definitely want to avoid those things. But like I say, I won't videotape all of it, but I'll kind of clear out my fire area here and then I'll move on in the video. Well, I'll probably throw out my sleeping bag. I forgot to do that earlier and let that puff up. But uh, then I'll move on to setting up what I call a tensegrity fire system. It's a little bit different. You're using the tension of rope to really um, sustain and give flexibility to your cook setup. So stay tuned, there's more interesting stuff coming. I cleared out the space for the fire to go. It's about two and a half, maybe three foot to be quite honest, across. So it should give me an area to work in. There was a couple of small roots and stuff I had to pull out and make sure they weren't burning, but you know, uh, the pile I set over here now and uh, 
I'll put the fire pretty well dead center right of this dirt. And that way I feel secure that I'm not, you know, causing any underground fires. But I'll just stop and catch my breath here because it's a bit of work digging roots and pulling them out of the ground. But uh, yeah, I'll cut over to making my fire system next. So one of the things I need for setting up the fire area is a Y-shaped stick. So I found this already half dead plant growing. I'm going to harvest that. I really got to loosen that screw. I just swapped out the blade on this and I believe I've just put it in too tight. So let's see if I can just... Ah. Oh, either way, I'll just use it as such. So I'm going to take off the one piece of the Y. Hopefully you guys are able to see this okay. The Y is right here in the branch. I only need a small Y. It doesn't have to be huge. So I'm going to harvest off this chunk. So I just have the Y on the one end. I'm having a hard time with my saw today. Just being an idiot. Oh well. And now when it comes to... Sorry, step that out of the way. I'll take this off too. I really got to fix this saw or I'm going to trash it again. So when it comes to couple feet down now from that Y. I want to slice on a sharp like 50 degree angle. You know, so there's a good spike on that end and I want to give it a bit of length for sure. So hopefully the camera's getting that. As you can see, a nice sharp end so it can drive into the earth easy. And on the other end, it's just got that Y nub, you know, and like I said, that doesn't have to be massive. It's just got to be enough to hold a stick about thumb size onto it. So I'll take this. Now I need a straight long stick that's probably, I don't know, six, eight foot long. I'll hunt around the area I'm in for that. In fact, before I even go any further, just pull out my multi-tool I wear on my hip. It's got a screwdriver component. Just kind of loosen that a bit. So that my saw blade, I just, I only replaced the saw blade no time ago and just tighten this back up too tight. So that's a little better. I give it a little bit of a tightness because I like things kind of a little bit locked, but yeah, that's doable. So sorry about that. But like I said, I only just replaced the blade no time ago. And now that a bit of dirt and stuff has gotten back into it, it became a little tighter. So multi-tool, always a good thing to carry when you're in the wilderness. Just as a side note. So let's get that straight stick. That's about six, eight foot in length. Okay, so I managed to get a straight stick. Same area I grabbed the wood stick from. I think I said somebody was down in trees over there no time ago. And uh, they left a bunch of debris, so. Uh, take off a couple of the bigger pieces and in fact <coughs> this is where switching up to the bigger knife is kind of handy see you know you could saw through this and it's kind of awkward to as I just tried to show there to take off these little pieces whereas if you got you know a 10 12 inch blade with you especially when you're in these type of environments machetes and stuff can come in really handy because they can you know, saws make light work of a lot of axe work. Well, machetes make a, light, a lot of uh, light work out of saw work, you know? So you're always trying to be as efficient as you can. You know, it might not seem it, but the location I'm in right now is about 80, 85 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 25, 28 degrees Celsius, I think, somewhere in around that range. So it is warm. And one of the key things you want to remember when you're in a survival situation, you know, they always talk about when it's cold, you don't want to get hypothermia. Well, when it's in warm environments like this, you don't want to be breaking a sweat. You know, you don't, you, you don't want to be exerting yourself. If, if all you have on is the clothes on your body and that gets damp, it's fine and dandy when it's, you know, 25, 30 degrees Celsius out and you're in the warm sun. 
but in the nighttime when the temperature drops down to 10 12 degrees you know 55 60 you know in that range whatever 65 degrees fahrenheit when it gets down that cold all that moisture in your clothes is just going to make you feel really really cold so you know the more you regulate what you're doing you know when you go into the woods you notice the other animals they take their time normally they don't rush around you know that's they're regulating body temperature they're trying to use as few calories as they can so you know and and keep themselves as dry and as comfortable as possible so you know the same thing goes for us right you know, don't feel if you've got a project like this it may take you 20 minutes half an hour and you think in the beginning of it's only a 10 foot job if i just give her and yeah it could be but if you break a sweat in six hours from now when you're trying to sleep and you're totally uncomfortable because you're damp that's not a good thing right so you're better off to take your time and have comfort when you're sleeping than you are to be a little bit you know easy going in the day i don't know if that makes sense at all but hopefully you get what i'm saying so i've got my pieces of wood needed cut now i'll move into the assembly of stuff so i'll just grab a rock here So one of the first things you want to do when you're setting this setup up is determine where the flow of the main stick is going to be over the fire. Um, in my situation, I want to have a bit of an opening um, on both sides where I can walk the paths through so you don't want to pinch yourself off. So I could even turn around and set it maybe on a even, even a little bit more of an angle. Say about there. Yeah, that works. And the reason why I'm doing this is that Y stick now is going to make this setup directional. So when I put my Y stick into the ground, I want to uh, be about a half foot, maybe a foot or so, even a foot and a half back from that fire. And I want to have the Y running the same direction as the stick. So when the stick sets down into it, it's going to want to align in that position. So, like I say, nothing complex there. And that's in there pretty solid now. And this straight stick is gonna end up sitting in that pocket and pivoting, and potentially it'll be back further, but it'll be pivoting over the fire like such. So after uh, kind of getting a feel for the position of everything, this stick is a little bit too long. So I'm going to snub it about here. I'm going to take a good two foot off. I just don't need that length. So I'm, I'm putting the piece of wood into what they call a plumber's vise. And it allows you to kind of lock the wood into your body. You can hold on to this end. And then this side is kind of locked underneath your leg. And it keeps any saw work out of your inside area. Keeps it to the outside. So it's a much safer method to do any type of sawing. And because it's pinned in underneath your knee, it really locks that piece of wood solid. It's not going anywhere. It allows me to do clean cuts, if you will. So that's a plumber's vice. So yeah, that's a bit better. I just, like I said, just didn't need the length of the wood that I had. So that'll be closer to what I need. So to give you a bearing, it's about five foot. You know, but it, it really does depend. I got it to be cut a little long to begin with because depending on how high this is up and how far it is away from the fire and uh, you know those types of factors determines how long this stick needs to be. So it's better to harvest one that's a little long to begin with and cut off the surplus than it is to have to go back out and get an entirely different piece of wood, right? Okay, well I was going to show you one way to do the tensegrity setup, but I'm going to show you a more advanced way just because I thought about it and it's like, well, I've got this stick that came off cutting it off here to shorten that length and I just picked up another one off the forest floor and I'm going to make just a more flexible more advanced model because it's only early in the day and I've done better videography than I thought I was going to by this point so I'm going to cut this branch on a 45 degree angle nice and easy give the same kind of same kind of 45 degree angle cuts, 50 degree angle cuts, like I was talking about earlier in the video. Let me set that aside. Now I'm going to take that, got a couple pieces of cordage I already grabbed out of the bag. 
So I got two loops. Like I say, people have watched previous videos of mine know I use tons of loops in my videos. So I've got two loops, double them up. I'm gonna take this big stick. I'm gonna set the square ends together of the ends, if you will, not the pointy end. Set that on. I'm gonna twist the small one. It'll be tight about there. Now, I'll just stop for two seconds. Uh, I've got one of my guy lines, and I was talking earlier about how I've got a prussic that sits on my guy line. And then normally I have little eyes that sit on the other end. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the eye part, I'm gonna set it onto itself and just get it to form a new secondary loop. I'm gonna wrap that onto this branch and just let it kind of sit on there. And now I'm gonna take that other branch and on the opposite side, like I did on that one, I'm gonna make sure that the 45's uh, facing away. I wanna put the blunt, end, blunt ends to each other. Double up that cordage, form a double loop, set it on both, and just twist the smaller one until it becomes tight. And that's the thinking. Now, I'm gonna set that about, make sure I'm not hooked on that rope. I'm gonna set that about a foot, maybe a foot and a half back from the Y. Just drive that into the earth and make sure my line is uh, 90 degrees to this Y that's gonna be sitting over the fire. I wanna make sure these are really well into the ground. So they're not going anywhere, but I don't want this piece of wood touching right to the earth. I want it to be up a little bit. Now the thinking really is that prussic that's on the line is adjustable. And like I talked about earlier, you can take that prussic, fold it on itself, grab the two center cordages, open it into a new loop, and then I'm gonna take the end of the stick, gonna make it a bit bigger, take the end of the stick and I'm gonna set that right onto that loop and use that lark's head knot like we talked about earlier. Cinch that down so it's nice and tight on there. And now that's gonna sit across that stick. Now what that allows me to do now is I can adjust this stick back and forth over the fire and the tension of the cordage is gonna lock that stick and hold it. But then I can also turn around and move where I hooked onto that main stick, shift it to the side so I can get left to right and up and down and back and forth. It allows me to cover all my main directions that I would want to move my cooking pot as it was sitting over top of the fire. It gives me that flexibility, the same as a tripod would have. I can go front to back, left to right, and up and down. Those are key things you want to be able to do as you're setting your pot over top of the fire. And like I say, it's easy enough to position this back. You know, as the, as the weight of the food is sitting on here, it's going to just keep tension. You don't have to worry too much. You know, even sitting it as itself, if I make sure that this end is longer and heavier than this end, you're gonna have, you know, the, the fulcrum point is gonna be able to hold the balance of the weight. And now you're using tensegrity strength where you can adjust up and down, like I say, you can adjust this prussic up and down and it'll control how high that stick is sitting over top of the fire. And you can control that literally to the centimeter, if you will, or to the inch, the half inch of exactly how you wanna position those things. It gives you that level of flexibility. So this is a tensegrity setup. I'll show it to you on a different angle a little closer so you can see the details. So the first thing I'll do is just turn around and put a food weight, if you will, water weight on this end. So I'm gonna take another one of my loops. I say I must have 30 of these, 25, 30 of them sitting in my bag. I just feed it through itself. So I'm onto there and I'll just set that on to the wood. Now this isn't exactly how I would turn around. I mean, you, 
you could with slight modifications, but this isn't exactly how I would normally hook onto that wood. I'll just put a lark's head knot on there so it's a little firmer. But I just want to show you as I move and position this tensegrity setup, the how I can get this um, container to move and, and position itself over top of the flame. But yeah, I'll just throw that on as an example for now. So yeah, hopefully this is a better angle. So like I said, right now that water container is sitting dead center over the fire. It would be simple enough to slide this stick forward, which would cause it to drop a little bit, but then I can adjust at this prusik to lift it back up again. So I can position it where I want. If I see that I'm a little off to the left, I move my connection with the lark's head onto this brace stake down below and the water bottle has now shifted to the right. If I move it further to the left, I can move it further and further. You know, normally you'd only need to move subtle variants. Now I'm in a position where that water bottle is sitting entirely off the fire. So, you know, I don't necessarily want to go that far. I'll set it back to the center. But like I say, now with the center point, if I see that the flames are really high or anything else, it's really easy enough. I could just, like I said, adjust this back if I wanted to. But it's really in the tensegrity of this uh, Prusik loop and how it gives you that flexibility. Hopefully the camera's picking this up. I'm raising that water bottle now, probably a good foot or so above and off the flame. And just as easily as that, I can slide that Prusik back and as you can see, I could potentially just be barely sitting over top of embers at this point. And uh, I have that level of flexibility with this setup. So it's good in that regard. I still do prefer the tripod, but this is probably one of my, if I was forced to go with an alternative setup, this would be one of the ones I'd really want to go with. To me, uh, these are resources I always have in my bag. I have loops that made this kind of three stick base. Um, I have these loops in my bag all the time. I have these guy lines with prusiks on them all the time. I don't even have to manufacture any of the equipment uh, that I would be using. They're readily available out of my bag. So, but yeah, that's a tensegrity grill. So as you can see, I finally got my sleeping bag out. I keep forgetting about that, but, but yeah, just kind of shift angles, show you a, a slightly different angle of it. Shift that back out, drop that back down again, shift it to the left and to the right. Like I say, swung right out off the fire pit entirely and can still raise that and lower it to whatever position I want. Great alternative method to a tripod really. But as you can see, the camp's almost set up now. I might show one or two small things in the video. I think I'm gonna go back to the vehicle and grab some of the wood I got sitting in the back of the truck. I don't really wanna, first time back out in a while, I don't really wanna be slogging through harvesting out of the forest today. I just feel lucky that I'm able to be back out into the wilderness again. I think it's been a couple months since I've done a video like this. So, but yeah, I'll, uh, Run back out to the vehicle, grab some wood, but as you can see, the camp is almost set up now. So, and as you can see, I've gathered up some small dry sticks that were in the area and made a bed because I know this dirt is a little damp. So when I go to get the fire started, I want to get it up off the moist earth, if you will. So this little bed of sticks just helps that. I did go out to my vehicle and grab a stack of wood. Potentially, I might cruise back. It's only probably about, I don't know, 500 yards slash meters, maybe, maybe 800. Yeah, probably closer to 800 uh, meters back out that way. So it's not, it's not like it's a huge journey to get back to, but I'll probably go back and grab a, a little bit extra wood. And uh, I've got to go into the surrounding area, gather up some really tiny twigs, you know, the ends of branches, that kind of stuff, um, you know, pencil size and smaller. And then I'll grab some 
of pencil size to potentially maybe as big as my wrist in size of uh, dry wood that's in the area that I'm in and uh, get little piles together so I can get my fire going. I'm going to make it fairly simple today and I'm given, like I say, first time back in the woods for a while so I, uh, I uh, will probably get my fire going early. I've got a meal that's a little bit different. Um, while I was in lockdown I was thinking about uh, how to lighten my weight of food and that kind of stuff so I came up with this concoction potentially I'll show you later in the video where I take uh, dehydrated potatoes um, dehydrated powdered you know these are all powdered if you will dehydrated powdered potatoes um, powdered cheese I take a beef oxo like a oxo uh, beef soup mix and uh, I mix those all together and when I add water to them it forms um, cheese and gravy mashed potatoes and then I have dehydrated bacon bits that I've added into that mix so potentially I just cook it on uh, I cook it you know boil some water add that to it and uh, it'll turn into mashed potatoes with gravy and uh, and cheese and bacon and that kind of stuff all into it so but uh, I'll, I'll show it to you later in the video like I say depending on time I know this video is probably already getting long but I'll try to get my fire going a little earlier today normally in my videos I like to do fires near the end of the day but uh, I'll get a small fire going just to kind of wrap up this video because I always like to end it with a you know fire at the end of the show if you will but I want a few hours to myself and it's been the first time I've been back out into this environment for a couple months now I'm eager to just kind of tromp around and stuff I don't think there's going to be much that's worth seeing on uh, on camera so I won't bother recording it but uh, yeah so I'll get my fire going a little earlier than I normally would but uh, yeah let me go gather up some uh, wood resources and then I'll cut back so now I've just gathered some sticks from the area that were dead. I created a small batch of pencil and smaller size pile there. Now really I'm just prepping up my next size up pieces of wood. If there's anything that's kind of in between a pencil and uh, and my wrist, uh, you know they kind of go off to this pile. In fact, I really break it into two separate piles. Say, you know, the smalls of those ones I put into that pile and then I keep the bigger ones over here. And really all I'm doing is taking a couple dead dry sticks that were laying on the forest floor. You know, if I see that there's tiny pieces still attached to them, I'll add it to my smalls pile, if you will. And then as I go up in size, set a couple of the smaller ones aside that are just bigger than the smallest pile and anything else that's kind of bigger than that and that's really just to help get the fire going to begin with so I've got one more stick here I'll burn through that then I should have my piles together to start to get the fire going so I popped my water bottle back off where I was using it as a sample earlier and then just pulled out my cooking kit out of my bag, you know, the small version one I have. So the thinking really is I would definitely want to get some water into me. I've got some gear here, so just bear with me. I pop that out. Alcohol stoves and tea bobs and those types of things, but I just want to get some water into myself and I'll pour some water into this that's gonna be my main cooking container I'm not gonna actually use my bottle to boil in and I can see I'm gonna have to get myself some more water side issue but now that loop I was using to hold on to the bottle. I'm just gonna take that, fold it over on itself, reach in, grab those two center pieces, kind of open them up, form a loop, slide a stick onto it, and set that with the lark's head knot, just like I've used earlier in the video. I'm just gonna set that right center of that stick. And the thinking really is that stick is gonna prop up this container over top of the fire. So I'm just going to create another large head knot on here and attach it back onto the cooking setup we have. 
So you can see now, I just used my cooking kit where I put that lark's head knot on the top. That can obviously be adjusted up and down the stick as well if you wanted to bring it in or out of the fire. But there's the little toggle holding onto the bale handle of the pot. You know, I do a similar thing with the water bottle, but these little toggles can be invaluable to use in a multitude of different things. So like I say, that's pretty well dead centered and ready to go. I'll just shift it back now and kind of get it off where I'm going to get my fire going. But uh, yeah, I'll boil off that water and uh, see if I can't make myself some mashed potatoes. Okay, well, get this fire going. Oh, of course, I forgot to put my knee pads on. Well, we're into it now. <laughs> so I've got some fat wood here. I'm going to set that aside. Like I say, I plan on kind of doing this as a simple fire. So I've got a little waterproof container I normally carry on my keychain. And in there, I carry cotton and fat wood chunks. So I'm going to use those to get my fire going. Just because I can't be bothered to go scrape a cedar tree down and harvest and all that stuff. Like I say, I'm trying to make this an easy going one. <laughs> but, you know, when you're out in the woods, these things can quickly add up to a lot of work. But uh, I've got my knife and my ferro rod. So I've got my small bundle here that's going to be ready. With my fat wood, I'm just going to break those in half. Just so I have them at the ready. So like I say, let's get this fire going. Come on, maybe I should fluff up the cotton a bit, I guess. That'd probably be the prudent thing to do. Yeah. Let a little bit more air get at it. I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, but they'll be gone in a minute when this fire gets going. Well, that went easy enough. And nice to just get a ferro rod fire going again. Let me say, I'm just really pleased to be back out in the woods again. It's been a while. And uh, like I said, I know it's been a bit since I've put together a video. I debated on doing a video about my prepping for the big Rona, if you will. But then I thought, yeah, maybe I don't want to let everybody under the sun know exactly what I'm up to when it comes to those things. No, I'm of the approach of we're a long ways out before this thing is over. And uh, I highly recommend to uh, anyone you should be preparing. I believe that the worst of things to come in that regard is still ahead of us. So the prudent thing to do would be stock up on rice, you know, pasta, dry beans, oils, um, canned meats, those types of things. I believe that uh, we're going to be needing them in the days to come. But I don't really want to get too much into that whole topic of things, other than the fact of people should prepare. I highly recommend you do so. It's like I say, all that wood was just local off the environment. There really wasn't much to it. I know there's moisture in it. You can see it in the white smoke. But hopefully those flames will have enough strength to kind of dry out that wood and get it to go. It looks like it is. They weren't too bad. So I'll let this burn a little bit, then I'll add on these, and then I'll move up into my actual main wood. But like I say, I just want to get it to the point, really, I might even let the fire die back when I go running around and just rebuild it again later. But uh, I really want to just get some food into me and show you guys this kind of powdered concoction. When I tried it at home, it tasted really fantastic, so. But I think, you know, the proof is in the pudding. When when you're out in the bush and you've done a bunch of work in a day, it's, do you feel like it's sustaining you? And time will tell. 
So the fire is not very strong right now, but that's okay. I'm not overly concerned. Like I said, if I can get away with not even cutting into that wood, that would be ideal. And I'll just use that later on. But I really just want to try to get this onto the flame as quickly as possible. So I'll lift it up a little higher, shift it in, and then I know I'm going to want to adjust that to be, I think it's that way a bit more. Eh, maybe, maybe not. Shift that forward a bit. In fact, I'll bring that back that way a little. Now I'm going to let that down. So you can see that's the kind of granular level control you can have over it. I'm hoping as that fire strengthens and burns up through the pile, the flames will burn right into the pot. You know, I don't want to wait for coals or anything. I really don't like wasting resources. I see a lot of these bushcraft videos where guys get these big fires going and then they wait for the fire to burn down to coals before they start cooking. I'm of the approach of if you've got a grill hanging from here, use the open flame. Don't use your resources. You know, just adapt how you're cooking things so that it works better for you. We can even let that down a little bit more. But like I say, as soon as I get this to a boil, I'll cut back and add in the potato and I'll kind of show you guys what that looks like and what I'm having for dinner. <laughs> So, as you can see, the fire is starting to strengthen. The flames are now starting to lick the bottom of the can. That's exactly what I wanted to see. So, another two or three minutes has passed by. As you can see, that canister is fully, you know, in the flame now. And now that that wood's died back a bit, like I said, I can even adjust that where I drop the can right down so it's sitting as deep into that flame as I want, right? I'm floating about maybe a centimeter, quarter inch or so above that one stick. But it's a prime example of how efficient the control is. So yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna do. I kind of pondered while the camera was off. If I'm just gonna use this to get the water to a boil, I'm gonna save off the wood that I brought in and burn that later on. I just, at least you guys get a fire so you feel like the show's kind of, you know, gone through its full fruition, if you will. But uh, in another couple minutes, that water should be at a boil and I'll be able to add in the uh, concoction. But I'm gonna add in just spoonfuls of this. And as they rehydrate, they'll thicken. This container holds about 500 milliliters. So now it'll take a minute for this to kind of thicken up and that kind of thing. As all these dehydrated bits thicken and expand, I'll just keep topping it up as needed until it reaches the consistency that I'm looking for, which is really thick mashed potatoes. So I'll keep doing that. I could stop here and just drink this almost like a stew. But uh, like I say, I, I wanna have it where it's more of a thickened meal. So I'll, I'll give this a few minutes to let it just absorb the liquids and thicken up as we go. And then I'll show you what it looks like uh, once everything's kind of ready to eat. So. I've let it thicken up a bit and added more to it to get it to the point where, as you can see, it's almost like a, well it is, mashed potatoes with gravy and cheese. Oh, and bacon chunks. Mmm, delicious bacon chunks. So good. 
Now to give you an idea, this is about two bowls worth. So for my calculations, I worked out, this is about 1200 calories sitting in this container right now. And to show you how much I used out of the container, hopefully the camera's catching that all right. I used about half, maybe two thirds of this container. So when it comes to calories versus carry weight, it's definitely a win in my books, but beyond that, to have something I can just add water to that is this delicious is impressive within itself. So I imagine you'll probably see more of this stuff in my future videos because it's great. <laughs> but there you have it. I'm going to stop and eat lunch. And I'm going to probably wrap up this video here pretty quick. I might do a closing scene or two, but like I said, I want a few hours to myself. I'll just kind of relax and enjoy things. So good. So hey there fellow YouTubers, it's Frank Bush here again. Thanks for tuning in to another one of my bushcraft adventures. I know I'm cutting it short a little bit on this one. Normally I, I let the fire go closer to when the sun goes down, that type of stuff, and do closing shots of the fire. But I hope you enjoyed the way I set up the uh, plow point shelter behind me here using the bipod. You know, quite often when people put up plow point shelters, they'll attach them directly to a tree, which can have limitations. I didn't have to go and put this ridge line out across here. I could have easily just run some cords down to the ground then had a fire out in front of me more. You know, which would have been a simpler setup, but I like to have these creature comforts and stuff just in case it rains. It gives me areas to work in and that kind of stuff. But uh, I hope you like the uh, Tensegrity grill hang here as well, or cooking system, if you will. Uh, if you're not wanting to go with a tripod, which for me is my tried and true method normally, um, these are easy alternatives. If you have these kind of basic setups, like the guy lines with the uh, prusik loops and those types of things and, and loops in your bag, it's easy enough to whip these types of things together. I think to put this entire thing together only took me maybe about 10, 15 minutes. You know, it really didn't take very long and that was me dawdling. You know, if you can you can whip this stuff together really rapidly if you've got the right cordage already with you. But if you enjoy this type of content, please like, share and subscribe. And thanks for watching. Cheers.